Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 14. We've been talking about striving together in the sense of pulling together, working together uh, like a crew rowing in a rowboat. And when they all are pulling at the same time with the same power and the same strength, uh, they can move right along very slick across the water. If one side's pulling a little stronger, they're going to start going uh, a little bit at an angle. If they pull too strong against the other side, they could go in circles and not get where they're headed. And so when you're pulling together, striving together, it's about working together. And we talked about ministry and home, revival, relationships, prayer, unity, forgiveness, confidence in God, generous living. And uh, for two weeks, we talked about maturity and how that uh, even growing in Christ uh, is not a, uh, something that we do by ourselves. It is a team sport. And God gives us the local church to grow in uh, Ephesians chapter 4. You, you can find all that there. Uh, but tonight we're going to talk about striving as the body of Christ. Striving as the body of Christ. And I know it's strange times and people think that there are certain things we can do and can't do. But if you're part of the body of Christ, you're still part of the body of Christ. And uh, nothing has changed because the circumstances have changed, but uh, we need to make sure we have a biblical understanding. Certainly, uh, you don't have to do much visitation. You don't have to do much door knocking to find out people's ideas about attending church and being religious are not scriptural. In fact, you don't have to do a lot of prayer and soul searching to find out many times our attitudes are not necessarily scriptural about things. It's easy to get our own thoughts. And so what the Word of God does constantly is it teaches us, reminds us, and renews to us how God intends things to be, and, and it's supposed to uh, uh, reprove, rebuke, and uh, correct us, and instruct us in the way of righteousness, because all Scripture is given by inspiration of God for those purposes. And so if you're there in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, if you'd stand, if you're physically able for just a moment, we'll read the first couple of verses there, and then we'll pop, pop down, read verse 27, and then look at some other verses in that area. But uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 says, For as the body is one... And hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. So it's simply talking about you have a physical body and you have many members, fingers and toes and eyes and ears and nose and all those funny things that go together. And, uh, and yet it's one body, it's not many. And so you have many members, one body, one body, many members, and then it simply says, so is Christ. So that's what we call a metaphor or an analogy. And there are many in the Scripture, and we'll talk more about that next week. We'll actually talk about the metaphor of the body. The Bible talks about the church being a bride. The Bible talks about the church being a house. The Bible talks about the church being many things, but uh, being even a flock. But the one thing it says more than anything in the New Testament is the church is a body. Then it goes on, verse 13, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. And then you drop down to verse 27, Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. He's writing to the church at Corinth. He's writing to all believers down through the centuries that would believe, be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would accept Christ, and under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, you would be convicted to be scripturally baptized and to be a member of a local New Testament church. And as a part of that church, you are a part of a visible body of Christ. Now, there's a spiritual unity in Christ, but there is a physical local church uh, expression of that unity. And that's what the Bible's writing about because uh, here in the, 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 they write about the body. Things that are going on in Africa, we may hear about them, know about them now, but think about the times when the Bible was being written. Uh, they wouldn't know what was going on halfway around the world. What was going on with the body of Christ was about what was going on in that local assembly. And so that's what the Scripture is getting at, and we're going to look at some of that tonight, striving as the body of Christ. Father, we thank you for your goodness, for your word, and for the people that have been faithful to be here. I pray we just uh, really great gain instruction and be reminded of some things that we may already know. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. You know, for 33 and a half years, the Lord Jesus Christ moved and walked on this earth. It's mind-boggling that God would lead hev leave heaven. He didn't have to, but He wanted to uh, be able to come down, and, and He wanted to be able to uh, be tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He wanted to, uh, to know what people were going through, but most of all, He wanted to become the perfect sacrifice. He was God, and it was God that was offended, and only the blood of God that had never sinned against God could pay for the price of our sin, because God said, I require of the blood on the altar. And so it had to be the blood of Jesus Christ. So he left heaven. We know 
uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who was rich, but he became poor, that through his poverty we might become rich, it tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 9. He demonstrated the love of God to the lost and broken world. I mean, he healed people. He helped people. I mean, imagine when they were trying to crucify him. He said, for what good deed are you putting me to death? And what he had done was he had come to say, you need a Savior. And by that implication is that I, I'm not perfect in and of myself. I'm not complete in and of myself. I'm in some situation where I need fixed. And people don't like to know that. They don't like to hear that. Hey, let's face it. Even we would like to think that we're doing a lot better than sometimes we are. And so the world wanted to kill him, not for good deeds that he did, but for what he was exposing by the righteousness that he was preaching to them. He showed compassion on those hurting and wounded. I mean, he would, uh, he would give the, uh, the deaf hearing. He would give the blind sight. He would go and touch the person that had leprosy that nobody else wanted anything to do with. He showed those around him what it meant to be a true servant. Man, he said, I came not to, minister, to, uh, to be ministered to, but to minister and to give my life a ransom. He took that towel and he took that water and he washed the feet of his disciples. What a humble act. He boldly declared a clear message of hope and salvation. The work that Christ began with his physical body, he now continues through his spiritual body to do through the church. You have to grasp that. Every conversation we have, everything we say, every, act, every way we act and react to the world around us, we're saying this is what Jesus would do if he was here because we are his spiritual body. He is the head, but we are his hands, we are his feet, we are his mouth. There are many members. There's only one head, and it's Christ. That's why we're not denominational in our thinking, because we don't want to put men between us and God. We don't have to vote on anything. The head tells us what to do. The head is in charge. Jesus is the head, but we are his body. And so sometimes when we think, well, you know, I got a little bit of anger or I've got a little bit of bitterness or I've got a little bit of an idea. I know that's not quite the Bible. You have to understand, we are the body of Christ. We are doing what he tried to do while he was here. So when you see his example in the scripture, that's what he's hoping through the person of the Holy Spirit that we will do. Now that's, that's a challenge. And you know what? You and I will never do that in our flesh. Because it is divine work, and we in human form cannot do divine work. We can only do that as the Holy Spirit of God and the Word of God influences our human heart and our human life. And so God's Word refers to the local church as the body of Christ. You know, a lot of people say, well, the church belongs to God. The church is more than belonging to God. It's kind of like a possession. My car belongs to me, but my car is not my body. And the church belongs to Jesus Christ. He purchased it with his blood. We understand that. But it's not simply a possession that he puts out so that he can show it off and shine it up and look at it. It literally is the body that he uses to reach the world and to touch the world and to teach the world of his love. It's hard to comprehend that he would put that kind of trust into redeemed sinners' hands. But that's what he does. We are his spiritual body. Romans 12, 4 and 5 says... For as we have many members, again, same thing 1 Corinthians says. That's talking about your body. You have many members in one body, and all members have, this, uh, and all members have not the same office. In other words, your eyes don't do what your ears do. And your feet don't do what your hands do. And your heart doesn't do what your lungs do. And your brain doesn't do what everything else does. And so it says, listen, you have many members, and they have not the same office. So we... Now he moves from your physical body back to the believers there at Rome, not Corinth. He's talking to a group of the believers in Rome. Now we, being many, are one body in Christ and everyone members one of another. In other words, uh, the, the local church body, we're members one of another and we move as one force for Christ. Ephesians 1 uh, verses 22 and 23, it says there, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all. Christ is the head. The Bible is very clear on that and says it over and over again. Ephesians 4.12 we talked about putting some in the church, uh, apostles and prophets and teachers and pastors for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body. In verse 16, uh, we saw how that the body edifies itself. It strengthens itself. 
Colossians 1.24 says, Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Paul says, I am suffering what I'm suffering to the, uh, uh, to the believers at Colossae. He says, I'm suffering in my flesh for the body's sake. What body's sake? The church, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 2.19, and, uh, and not holding the head from which all the body uh, by joints and bands having nourished, ministered, and knit together increases with the increase of God. So it's the head which is Christ that holds the whole thing together, and he saves us, he convicts us, he saves us, and then he uh, puts us in a local church so that we can be members together to accomplish something. We are not simply his prize he puts on the bookshelf. We are literally... His voice, His heart, His hands, His feet to do the will of Almighty God. He did it when He was here, but when He left, He left that to the spiritual body. The function of the local church is to carry out the will of Jesus Christ. It's to point men and women to Him and serving as His agents in the world. We are not our own. It says in Acts 20, 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over which the Holy Ghost had made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. The third verse of Onward Christian Soldier describes our role as the body of Christ. It says, like a mighty army moves the church of God. Brothers, we are treading where saints have trod. We are not divided, all one body we, one in hope and doctrine, one in charity. <clears throat> Unity is not nice when it comes to the body of Christ, it's necessary. I mean, we look at our country, we say, boy, the lack of unity, the division, but you're talking about a country. You know what happens when one cell, one tiny cell in your body begins to attack itself? You can get cancer, you can get mass, you can get uh, uh, different kinds of autoimmune diseases when one miniature cell out of the millions in your body begin to attack itself. You can't afford one member. So you get in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and if we don't understand the need for unity, we may have church and we may have religion, we may have doctrine, but we are not going to be the body of Christ that the Bible is teaching that Christ wants us to be. Because let me tell you something, you know what the body of Christ in the, under the Roman Empire and during persecution, you know what the, the early body of Christ did? It turned the world upside down with the gospel. They said those who've turned the world upside down have come here. And it was because of the unity. You, you study the book of Acts and you'll see unprecedented unity. And so there are three keys to understanding our role in the body of Christ. We're only going to deal with one of them tonight. We're going to deal with the other two, Lord willing, next week. But there is the ministry of the Spirit, the ministry of the Spirit or the Holy Spirit. And we read the verses there in verse 12 where it talks about, uh, or verse 13, I said, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. In other words, the Holy Spirit convicts us, and through the Holy Spirit we are redeemed and we're placed into Christ. And then it is the Holy Spirit that speaks to our heart and says, I want you to go and be scripturally baptized and join such and such a church and be a part of that body. And so with that in mind, we, the ministry of the Spirit is very important. Jesus explained to the disciples in, in John chapters 14 through 16 that upon his depart, departure, the Holy Spirit would come into their lives, enabling them to fulfill his will while laboring in the, in, in the local New Testament church. Do you remember me? when Jesus was here, man, they kept uh, doubting him. They kept questioning him. Uh, Peter said, no, Lord, you can't go to Jerusalem and die. And, and, and Thomas doubted after his resurrection and all those things went on. And, and they all forsook him and fled. And for the most part, they were a pretty big mess. But did you notice what happened after they tarried for 10 days in the power and the person of the Holy Spirit came upon them? Suddenly, Peter standing on the day of Pentecost, the denier, and he's preaching with boldness without fear. Something changed because Jesus came to be the sacrifice for our sins, but the Holy Spirit came to be the enabler of the child of God to be the body of Christ. So he not only convicts us of our sin, converts us into salvation, but he leads us to be a part of a local body and gives us the gifts and abilities to be able to do something in that body. So he told them that was going to happen. It says in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, and then, assembled, uh, and then being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he, saith he, 
he have heard, ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Listen, you cannot live your Christian life simply on doctrine. Doctrine is important. You cannot live your Christian life simply on a ritual and regiment and discipline. You need the Holy Spirit of God to work in your life. And so it's the ministry of the Spirit that we're going to look at here in a moment in verses 4 through 11. There's two specific benefits provided to us by the Holy Spirit when it comes to the body of Christ. Number one, He provides the miracle of unity. It is a miracle when people get along, especially when they get something so big. See, here's the reality. Most people that are fussing and fighting in churches for whatever reason, it's not on how to reach the lost. They're fussing on something that, that wasn't done their way or some program that wasn't the way they thought it should be or, 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 or we're not being careful enough with the pandemic or we're being too careful and we're bowing to the government and, and all kinds of things are upset, but people are not quitting church because you're not, you're not wit, going soul winning enough and you're not preaching the gospel enough and we're not trying to reach people enough. Mo, it's most everything else. But listen, unity is not built on us all agreeing on everything. Unity is built on having something bigger than every disagreement that we have. And that's what the body of Christ is supposed to be. With Christ as our head, Christ supersedes all of our different personalities and desires and different ways of looking at things and so on. It says in chapter 12, verses 4 through 7, right before the verse we read, now there are diversities of gifts, meaning that there's just different spiritual gifts. There's many different types of gifts. That means every member is different, just like the eye is different, the ear is different. People in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ are going to be different. Now, what does difference uh, create? You know, uh, people talk about racism. It's really ethnicity that gets people in trouble. I, I lived in Africa for 10 years, and Africans were killing Africans, and they were all black. But they were tribal, and they had different ethnic ideologies and different ethnic traditions and different ethnic thoughts. And so ethnicism is what really gets us through. And so when somebody comes along, it's not of our ethnic group that we understand. It's easy to be uncomfortable and prejudiced towards things we understand. And so here is, the Bible says that there are, uh, there's, uh, uh, there are diversities of gifts. So, so people, if you're not careful in the church, can say, well, they don't, uh, they don't feel like I feel about things. They don't think like I think about things. They're not supposed to because that's a difference in spiritual gifts. But notice this there. It says there's diversity of gifts but the same spirit. Even though people are different, the same spirit have brought them together for a mightier cause than the differences. Then verse 5 says, and there are differences of administrations. There's different types of leadership and governments and ways to get things done. And everybody has different ideas about that. But then it says, but the same Lord. It's interesting. It says, same spirit, same Lord, same God. It's like the Trinity. All three of them are mentioned. But there are diversities of gifts. There are differences of administration. And there are diversities of operations. In other words, there's many different ways to get something done. But, there is only, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. So listen, there are different gifts. There are different ways to govern and administer. And there are different operations, ways to get where you're going. But there's only one God. And through the person of the Holy Spirit, it mentions Spirit, it mentions God, and it mentions Lord, but the point being that the Holy Spirit is the one who gets us to understand that whether we have a different gift than somebody else, whether we have a different type of government, way we would do things than somebody else, and whether we have a different operation to get there, we should all be led by the Holy Spirit for the same goal, the body of Christ, to move on His behalf on this earth. But it's easy to see all the differences rather than to see the sameness of the Holy Spirit. It is truly a miracle that people who are so different could also function in such unity. Our backgrounds are different. Our personalities are different. Our weaknesses, our strengths are different. Uh, you know, uh, here, here's the thing. We think, well, you know, the book of James said that if somebody comes in in great, great apparel and gold rings and stuff, you shouldn't give them a preferred seat and all that. Listen, he's not talking about us sitting together in church. I remember, you know, I, did, I, only, I only really started one church in Africa. I helped a lot of guys start a lot of churches, but we only started the church in Tamau, the little trading center there, and God just did an amazing work there. But, but, but you know, it was, it was 
we, we have diversity here, but we live in America. The diversity is not quite as grand as it is in, in the third world country. I mean, we had people in, in the Tamau church, men who had college educations and were far ahead. We had what we call Shamba men and women who did not even speak the trade language of Swahili. They didn't speak any English. They could not read nor write. They basically could barely speak their mother tongue, and we would have to translate the services clear down to the Kimeru language for those people. And you had college-educated people working right alongside of uneducated people for the cause of Christ. And they've had a tremendous ministry through the years because they don't see themselves as educated, uneducated, wealthy or poor, shamba or, or, or city dweller. They see themselves as a child of God who's been given a gift for a purpose of getting the operation and the administration done through those gifts, although they're diverse and different. And so when the guy gets up, and certainly one of the educated guys would get up, uh, when we went over there for the building dedication in, in February, a little over a year ago, uh, man, they had it, man, they had everything on the screen. They were ahead of us, man. They had the technology. Uh, I mean, they had it all on the screen. They had pictures and everything. And they had all of the, the smart guys and educated guys. Man, they were all in there reading off things, introducing people and running the program. And you had to have this choir singing, and then that 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 choir. I'm serious that for an hour and a half the choirs had to sing and somebody had that all organized and then they had to have announcements they had to have give a little history and, the, and somebody had to run the equipment which for over there that's pretty serious stuff to run all the projecting equipment all the time that's going on there were some shamba ladies cooking the, the the chai the tea and milk and sugar and and some shamba women that were cooking the food to feed that ma- that mass of people over a thousand people there for that dedication 1200 people you see, they just do, hey, we're, God's done something here. We're going to glorify him. It doesn't matter who does the cooking and who runs the machine, just so God gets the glory. Now, you know, I'll be honest with you. It seems a little harder for us to keep that under, in check in American culture, in Western culture. And I'm sure it is in Africa, too, because I'll be honest with you. I, I was with a lot of churches in Kenya. I even pastored another church uh, in Kenya, and, and I did not see that kind of unity that you, you saw there at Tamau. It was really kind of an eye-opener to me to see that kind, of, that, that kind of working together. And so God doesn't just want us to be of different educations, different backgrounds, uh, uh, different economic situations, and sit together in church. He wants us to work together as the body of Christ. That's, that's pretty challenging at times. So he provides this miracle of unity, uh, yet there is one thing we have in common. We have been placed into the family of God by His Holy Spirit. Dr. R.B. Roulette, who's been here and preached for us some years ago, he said, God does not expect unanimity. He expects unity. In other words, He doesn't want us all to agree on everything. He wants us to understand that there's something bigger than what we don't agree on. Not everyone is expected to think exactly the same as everyone else or even arrive at the same conclusions, but we are never to allow those differences in personality or preferences to create division because then the division stops the body of Christ. When differing people gather around one body of doctrine, read from one Bible, and walk in the presence and power of one Holy Spirit, then unity can be found. It's miraculous. But if we're not careful... We'll lose that and we'll get into the diversity of gifts. Well, I have the gift of mercy. I don't understand uh, how how that person over there can be so judgmental of that person because they got the gift of prophecy. Well, I've got the gift of giving. I don't understand why everybody doesn't see the need to give that because you have the gift of giving. Well, I could care less how many chairs are where and whether or not there's enough for everybody, but the person with the gift of administration can't stand if the chairs aren't where they're supposed to be before it all starts. And we can just frustrate ourselves if we don't understand the purpose of unity. So there is uh, the, the, uh, one of the specific benefits provided by the Holy Spirit. He, he provides the miracle of unity. Secondly, he provides a mosaic of giftedness. You know, a mosaic is you have different designs and different colors and different shapes, and you put it all together, and individually it just doesn't make any sense. And together it makes a mosaic. I'm not into mosaics, <laughs> but if you're into them, they're beautiful. How you can take such diverse things, put them together, and create something that's beautiful. And God takes such different things and people and their gifts, puts them together, and in a church that's functioning as the body of Christ, it's unbelievably beautiful to see God working when He's working. It says in 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 11, 
For to one is given the spirit of the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that, that one and self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. That spirit gives all these different things. You say, well, listen, certainly speaking in tongues, speaking in languages, that has to be the most important thing because that's what God gave me. Well, certainly uh, faith has to be the most important thing because I, I, I have to get to faith. Faith is important to me. Giving's important. And whatever's important to us, all of a sudden, if everybody doesn't see it the way we see it. In his wisdom, the Holy Spirit has given those in Christ's body a wide variety of spiritual gifts, like the pieces of a complicated mosaic. We are each unique, yet uh, when we are properly joined together, we become a whole masterpiece that serves as a testimony to our Creator. Hey, these gifts are given by God's grace. Remember we read Romans 12 uh, verses uh, 4 and 5 and it talked about one body, many members, and so is Christ. Well, it goes on to tell us there uh, in verse number 6, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given unto us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Some gifts unlike healing tongues and words of knowledge, or some gifts like he healings and tongues and words of knowledge were what we call temporary sign gifts to be used during the early ministries of the apostles and of the Lord Jesus Christ in the first century church and among Christians while they awaited the Bible's completion. Mark chapter 16 says it this way in verses 17 through 20. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues, other languages. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and, shall, uh, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. Verse 20 says, And they went forth, now these are the disciples, early church, and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and listen, confirming the word with signs following. The purpose of the signs was not simply to make everybody's life better. It was to confirm, hey, this message is a little different than the Old Testament. This is the New Testament. This is the completion of the Old Testament. This is not the get doing away with the law. This is the fulfilling of the law. And just because you might be a little worried about these people and this new doctrine, I'll give you these signs to confirm these people are from me. 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 10 says, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Verse 1 Corinthians 14, 22 says, Wherefore tongues are a sign not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. You know, most people say, well, you get in church and you speak in tongues to prove you're a Christian. It's not a sign for those that believe. It's for those who believe not. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, if an unbeliever comes in, what's he going to know about what you're saying if you're saying it in a language he doesn't understand? But to them that believe not, but prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. When you preach the word of God, you're preaching to believers so that they can believe more. So these, are, uh, these were uh, temporary sign gifts, and people will argue that till Jesus comes, whether they're still around or not. And that's not my point here. But there are seven permanent spiritual gifts listed there in Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. Therefore, the New Testament age and their permanent and their edifying gifts. In other words, they're given so that the body of Christ can function. Hey, listen, for our physical body, we need eyes to see. Well, that's what a prophet, a gift, the gift of prophet is. They can see things clearly. They can discern, not be deceived, not bump into things spiritually speaking, doctrinally, and so on. Uh, listen, we need uh, ears to hear, and, and, and so you have uh, the, the, the uh, person of, of exhortation that uh, is trying to encourage people to, he to hear what God's wanting them to do. And so, so, so just like our body has all these different members that do all these different things, well, the Bible says there's seven gifts that are supposed to build up the body of Christ so that the body of Christ can be here for Jesus on this earth in his absence right now. Because he's coming back, and he's going to rule himself, but until he does, guess what? We're his body spiritual body. So what are these gifts? Prophecy, it carries the idea of preaching and discernment. Now listen, there's some wonderful people 
in the house of God, but you don't want to leave them making decisions because they just don't discern things well. You say, well, they're dumber than a box of rock. Maybe they don't have the gift of prophecy. They love people, so they'll just buy into anything if it helps them to love. They're generous and they're merciful, so they'll just accept anything. That's why God says, let me put some prophets among you so you don't get too far off. Ministry carries the idea of helping or serving. Thank God for people that help and serve others. And you know, the danger of, of any church is that whatever the spiritual gifts of the pastor is, that's the things he promotes, that's the things that he attracts, and so everybody wants to be. Uh, so you'll get in a, if you get a, a pastor that has a gift of evangelism, everybody in the church has got to win 100 souls to Christ and mark their gospel gun, and that's what drives that church. You get a merciful pastor, everybody's got to be merciful and sometimes compromise is an issue. You get a prophetic pastor and everybody knows what everybody's doing wrong. <laughs> But no church should be like that. No church should be singular in its personality. It should have all the spiritual gifts, and they should all be encouraged. Prophecy, ministry carries the idea of helping serve. Teaching carries the idea of helping others understand truth. But we got some wonderful teachers around here that can just break down truth. Exhortation carries the idea of encouragement. And giving carries the idea of generosity. Ruling carries the idea of administration. And you know what? Everybody isn't good at administrating. Well, they planned an activity. We didn't even know where the hamburger was. It's not their spiritual gift. So get somebody with the gift of administration to make sure they know where the hamburger is. It could save the church. You laugh, but I'm serious. Churches are destroyed all the time over stuff like that. Mercy carries the idea of compassion. These gifts are chosen by God's will. 1 Corinthians 12, 11 says, But all these worketh that, same, that one and self-same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Listen, nobody decided to be a prophet. Nobody decided to be merciful. Everybody's supposed to give, but the person who has the gift of giving gives differently. Everybody's supposed to have some discernment, but the prophet discerns differently. Everybody's supposed to show mercy. Every one of these gifts. In fact, the more spirit-controlled you are, the more of these gifts you'll have in your life. But there's a naturally given one or two to you that you will excel at because God put it there. God is the one who decides who gets this, which gift. Those gifts are intended for his pleasure and glory, not ours. You know, we're so much about our church and what we want in our church. You know, we need to, everybody needs to approach everything in church, every meeting, every service, every situation, every circumstance as it's his church and I'm part of the body and we're supposed to build up the body. So what is it God wants to do? Not is what, what is it I hope to get out of this meeting? Revelation 4.11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are. And we're created. Romans 9 20 says, Nay, but O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him who for, that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? God, why'd you give me that spiritual gift? Why didn't you give me his spiritual gift? Why would we argue with God? Let's just use our gifts for the glory of God. A.T. Pearson lived in the late 1800s. He was a contemporary with C.I. Schofield. He followed a Spurgeon as the pastor of the Metropolitan Tabernacle, and he motivated many, many towards mission service, and many missionaries went out of his ministry. He shared seven principles regarding spiritual gifts, and we'll be done tonight, and our responsibility to use them for the local body. So these are seven principles regarding spiritual gifts and our responsibility to use them in the local body. Most people think, well, I just need to be faithful to church. No, you don't. You need to be involved with your spiritual gift in church. We, for far too long, counted our Sunday morning crowd and thought we were successful, when in reality, we need to see how the body functions. That's where success begins. And so here's what he says. He says, number one, every believer has some gift. Therefore, all should be encouraged. Say, well, I don't care if so-and-so leaves the church. We don't really need them. Wow. When did you and the Holy Spirit have that conversation? Every believer has some gift, therefore all should be encouraged. The problem is we don't encourage out folks well. In fact, what happens is some of us have been doing it so long, we, we kind of are possessive because they won't do it the way we do it. That's right, because they probably have a different spiritual gift. But they should all be encouraged. Number two, no one has all the gifts, therefore all should be humble. Well, boy, well, you ought to just be glad you got me at this church. Well, let me tell you something, you don't have all the gifts. If everything was like you, there'd be a problem. You need the balance. Number three, all gifts are for the body. Therefore, all should be harmonious. Your gift and my gift should not be in conflict with each other if the body is the purpose. But if you begin to worry about your gift, how you feel about things and how you see things, then the harmony has gone. All gifts are for the Lord. Therefore, all should be contented. 
Well, I sure wish I had. No, you, what you got, you got from God, for God, through the Holy Spirit. You ought to be content and excited and try to figure out how you're supposed to use it for the body. All gifts are mutually helpful, therefore all should be faithful. Well, I'm just, I just have the gift of service. They don't need me. Oh, yeah. We need every gift. All gifts, number six, promote the whole body's health. Therefore, none can be dispensed with. There's no gift we could do without. Well, I really don't need my big toes. Your balance won't be so good. I really don't need my eyes. Are you, are you kidding me? I guess I could give up my, my fingers or my toes. No, you want it all. And let me tell you, many churches are crippled. Many churches are blind. Many churches are deaf. Many churches can't reach out and hug the world as it's broken because many people are not allowing their member, their part, their gift to be used the way God intended for it to be used. All gifts depend upon the Holy Spirit's empowerment. Therefore, none should be out of fellowship with Him. I don't care how good your gift is, you need the Holy Spirit's wisdom or your gift will get the best of you. The ministry of the Spirit, it provides the miracle of unity and it provides a mosaic giftedness. Now, we're going to talk next week about the metaphor of the body and we're going to talk about the members of the body. It gets very specific, but it starts with the reality that the Holy Spirit of God gives us tremendous unity. It's a miracle of unity if we see it the way God intends for us to see it. And then there's a tremendous mosaic of gifts and we come together and now we're excited about what God's doing through the differences. We're not fussing about the differences. But you know, a lot of people don't even see, you know, I've come to church because they have a great nursery. No, you come to church because you're the body of Christ. You're not supposed to just get along and set together. You're supposed to find your place and plug in your gift and be doing something for God. Because listen, there's somebody God wants to reach out and tap on the shoulder. And if all the hand, fingers, toes, and wrists, if everything's not there, that person never gets tapped on the shoulder. Because some part of the body is missing. Some gift's not being used. Because somebody thought, well, that church really doesn't need me. Or maybe the church thought we really didn't need that finger to poke on that person. We need to understand the value of the body of Christ. He, for 33 and a half years, showed his love. Now he says, I'm going to leave it to my spiritual body. And let's face it, you look down through history and you look at even common things, and many times the church has not been speaking accurately for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's why it's important that we walk in the Spirit, be led to the Spirit, know the Word of God, because we are the body of Christ on this earth. So striving together is the body of Christ. Well, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. That's your opinion of what it is. God said, I saved you and I put you in the body and I gifted you. Now go out there and speak for me. Go out there and love for me. Go out there and touch for me. Go out there and walk for me. Go out there and work for me. People say, well, it's, you're just all about the church. I'm not all about this church. I'm all about his church. And every church that is a Bible-believing church is his church. And every healthy church impacts the world. The gates of hell cannot stop a church that understands the principles we looked at tonight. That's powerful. Let's stand together. Appreciate your faithfulness to the house of God, even on a stormy night. We're probably not going to do a, a time of invitation. Most folks know what God's speaking to our heart about. We are going to sing our chorus tonight as we dismiss uh, through our traffic pattern that we now have. But I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, it's amazing what, what, what bothers some people. I mean, even some of the adjustments we've had to make, making too many, not making enough. That's I, true, true, true. No matter who's doing it, it's going to be too many. But that's okay. If we got something bigger than our traffic patterns, our dismissals, our every other pew, we'll get over it all and we'll serve Jesus. We won't even let to wear a mask or not to wear a mask get in the way of serving Jesus. But isn't it amazing how much stuff can get in the way? of serving Jesus. Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I'm as guilty as any human being about not being the body of Christ you want us to be. Not saying what Jesus would say, not thinking what Jesus would think, not doing what Jesus would do in the moment, especially when the flesh gets stirred up or when temptation or lust or anger or all those things get to going or when my prejudice gets get kicked in. I don't have the heart and mind of God, but I have the Holy Spirit. And Lord, you have given me spiritual gifts and you've given everybody in this church spiritual gifts. First of all, we have to comprehend the body of Christ, the metaphor we'll look at next week. 
And then we have to understand we're not just supposed to get along with people. We're supposed to work together. We can't move our arm without many parts of the body, members working together. We can't walk across the room to pick up a cup of water without all the members working together. And a church cannot be what Christ intended for it to be until we understand the analogy of the body. Help us to grow in that. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.